Welcome back. We're back live in the booth here at OSCON 2011. I'm Gretchen Giles, and my guest now, I'm lucky enough to have a chance to talk to Ari Gentry, who is the founding president and CEO of BioCurious. And you presented today already, didn't you? I did. What was your, it was uh, garage biology and DIY bio? That's right. Because we can, because we have to, is what you said, <laughs> right? Exactly. So you came to DIY bio. Okay, what is DIY bio? What is DIY bio? It is a network of many people from many different backgrounds who are all brought together by a love for science, a love for citizen science. Amateur biology is what they're known for, but there's a surprising and growing number of professional scientists within it. Oh, right. um, they find it refreshing that people are doing science because they love it, because it's fun, returning to the roots for why people did science in the first place. Right. And what we see out of it is the transition from professional use patented equipment to do it yourself, make your own cheap equipment that oftentimes functions just as well as the expensive equipment. And I talked about DIY bio leading up to this biotech without borders world where we enable labs in places that have never had them because of the open source accessible tools that these biohackers are creating at a low cost that are available to anybody anywhere. So are you exporting this to like to Africa or countries where there you know a lot of misery, a lot of poverty and allowing you know them to create their own labs? Is that is that what you mean when you say you're giving them to people who don't have access? I won't take credit for giving the tools to anybody, but this is what I see as this utopia that it's not just a dream, it's something that we can help create. So mm -hmm. I I talk about the potential of DIY bio to try to inspire people to also get involved. If tools are made cheaply enough and made so they're available online, they can be exported to places like Africa, to places where um, villages are, um, are suffering rare diseases or, um, I forget the term right now, but there are diseases that affect um, small villages but not other places in the world. Mm. And there are diseases that aren't profitable for your Pfizer or your Merck mm. to create a pharmaceutical around, which costs billions of dollars. And some of these areas don't have the right sorts of diagnostic equipment to test for diseases nor to treat them. So mm. samples often have to be sent out to labs. Right. By the time they're returned, people That's can be devastated by disease. Mm even die. So my dream for DIY Bio, it does have a medical slant. There's lots of potential, but I think the ultimate is helping people live, right? <laughs> or live, live better lives or um, to help us save people's lives. And cheap diagnostics can be made and made available to everybody so that tests can be done without having to be sent out. Right. It's pretty simple and it comes down to cost and accessibility, what right. you know, open source is all about. Exactly. Now how did you come to this? Because were you in marketing? What were you? You were economics, that's right, you were an economist. Economics, right. finance. How um, did you make that? This is kind of a big leap, that's a huge divide. Or not? It's a big leap. It, my interests are not mutually exclusive. Uh -huh. I, I love the art, the skill of finance. I think trading stocks is fun, uh -huh. and I would enjoy doing it if I had enough spare time. But um, for my main reason for working, for living, for doing, it wasn't fulfilling. Uh -huh. And those are the sorts of things I didn't understand before I went to college. And when the time came to make the decision, what are you gonna do with the rest of your life? I, I only had familiarity with economics mm -hmm. and I, at the time, as I mentioned in my talk, I didn't understand what it meant to be a scientist. Mm -hmm. I thought it was a boring, isolating job. Even though science was fun, to be a scientist was not. Uh -huh. <sighs> and so I went down this path and continued to be unfulfilled. But I still love science. I still right. read about it. I still read about health news, um, about shifts in technology that were making people live longer and better. I thought, that's amazing. And I told the story about Goldman Sachs not hiring me and how it was a great experience for me. Uh -huh. How when they didn't hire me, I realized like I was actually relieved. <laughs> I was so happy that I didn't have to get myself into that position where I worked really hard for seven years to make a lot of money and then do something that I thought would benefit the world. Right. I just rethought what I was doing. I said, 
I'm going to do something that is fulfilling and something that positively impacts the world. That is so cool. And and you're able to make a living, right? You're not living in penury and woe, are you? It's a... Well. <laughs> <laughs> well. <laughs> um, something that uh, is really become a new meme is the quantified self, the idea that you sort of rate your own body. You know, does that fit in with the DIY bio at all? Or do, are you a practitioner? Do you, do you, is that something that... It's a really would... great question because we see overlap in the sort of person that mm -hmm. might do DIY bio and the sort of person that might do quantified self. The, the two practices aren't exactly related. So DIY bio, you're a lot of times making equipment or you're doing uh, genetic analysis at home or with others. Um, quantified self is similar because it's a scientific pursuit. Um, it's personal insights through data, mm -hmm. but the data is usually collected through you know, an iPhone right. or uh, what's coming to the scene now are commercial devices that you wear, um, okay. like the body bug uh, tracks your calories and um, uses galvanic skin response, pedometer. Wow. Um, it's pretty cool and pretty accurate. Um, Fitbit, or people tracking their food. There's even like EEGs that you can wear when you sleep or wow. while you're doing physical activities or even video games. Mm -hmm. And they have medical implications as well, just as in DIY bio, you can do medical diagnostic tests, mm -hmm. um, like testing if you have a gene that predisposes you to cancer or right. Alzheimer's. Right. And it's that same sort of natural curiosity that would lend somebody to trying either. Okay. I think we're beginning to see overlaps in the community. Uh -huh. um, I, I personally am involved in both. Uh -huh. um, I co-organize the San Francisco Quantified Self Group and I organize BioCurious meetups. Uh -huh. So it's pretty natural that people might right. jump from one to the other. Sure, that's interesting. And my final question is something that you touched on when we started, which is, um, the mixture uh, that your community has, mainstream scientists, you know, classically professionally trained PhDs, mm -hmm. and folks who just are interested. I was really surprised to learn that the classically trained scientists mix so well with the rabble, you know, that they, that they don't, um, th that they seem to accept that and not you know, turn their noses up. Is that your, that's, and why, <laughs> I guess. There, there's a disparity in scientists, uh -huh. for sure, and some don't take DIY bio seriously. Mm -hmm. And more and more in the past few years, the idea around DIY bio has been shifting. At first it was, nature wrote, is DIY bio a threat to biosecurity? Uh -huh. And now they're writing, DIY bio creates community lab. Um, and the, the just the tone has shifted. Mm -hmm. Might be writing about the same thing, but it's less threatening the more that we do. Right. And the more open we are about who we are and why we're doing this, I think it does attract scientists who originally got into it out of love for science. Uh -huh. um, I'm not an institutional scientist. I've just had friends who were and who got out of it as quickly as they could. Right. Because it was, it's really a place that can kill your creativity and kill the original passion that uh, that brought you into it. For example, any creations that you make on your university's campus or sure. at an institution, um, the IP that you create is owned by that institution. Yes. Yes. And you know, when you have an idea, like that's your baby, right? right? And then somebody takes it away from you. Um, it it doesn't. It's more uh, like giving a foundling innovation. to the institution. <laughs> But you know that contract when you enter into it. I mean, that is part of the contract, uh, yeah. and and that's you know of being supported, you know, to be able to do your research and, yeah. and earn a living. It's all fascinating stuff. I wish I could have seen your talk today, and I really appreciate you coming and talking with us now. Ari. It was my pleasure. Good. Thank you very much. My great pleasure too.